Chapter 6 Heather took a deep breath and spun around. Ben! Hi, Heather. He came jogging up to her, his work boots squishing in the wet snow. You scared me. Her heart was refusing to slow back down to its normal rhythm. Sorry. I thought you heard me calling to you. He smiled at her and put his arm around her shoulder. He was wearing his down blue jacket and had a blue wool ski cap pulled down over his ears. Hey, you're shaking. You, you really frightened me, Heather stammered. The parking lot is so dark here, and when I heard the footsteps behind me... You have too much imagination, Ben said. Now you sound like my uncle. She said it with more anger than she had intended. He's always putting me down for having an imagination. As if that's the worst thing in the world a person could have. I think he does it because he doesn't have any imagination at all. Sure he does, Ben said playfully. He has a dirty mind, doesn't he? Heather frowned and gave Ben a shove. That's not imagination. Don't be such a creep. Her car was a few yards ahead of them. What are you doing here anyway? How did you get here? Walk. You walked in the cold all the way to the mall? That's not like you. Hey, I just wanted to see you, okay? Why are you giving me a hard time? Heather knew why she was giving Ben a hard time. Snowman. She felt guilty about making the date with Snowman. She also wanted some time to think about Snowman. She didn't want to have to talk to Ben right now. Sorry, she said softly, pulling up on the car door. Come on, get in. I'll drive you home. He climbed into the passenger seat and struggled to get the seatbelt to click in. You don't have to make such a fuss with the seatbelt. I'm not that bad of a driver, Heather said irritably. Yes, you are, he said laughing. He finally managed to get it to click. So why are you here, she asked, searching her jacket pocket for the key. Stop being so friendly, he said sarcastically. He slid down in the seat and put his knee up on the dashboard in front of him. I felt bad about this afternoon, you know, about your uncle and everything. So I came to see how you were doing. Why is he being so sweet, Heather thought. It's almost as if he knows about Snowman, and he's come to make me feel bad. I'm okay, she said, turning the key, pumping the gas pedal. The car started right up. She turned on the windshield wipers. They scraped across the glass, pushing away the wet covering of snow. It was pretty embarrassing, Ben said, staring straight ahead to scraping wipers. I mean, the way he dragged you out of the car. It was like some bad TV show or something. I just want to murder him when he does things like that, Heather said, backing out of the parking spot. I try to be cool about it. I mean... I should be used to it by now, right? But I can't help myself. I just lose it. I thought you were pretty cool, he said, turning to her, reaching out, and giving her ponytail a gentle, affectionate tug. He just thinks I'm an object, a belonging of his, Heather said heatedly. He thinks he can do anything he wants, say anything he wants, in front of anybody. He doesn't care about me at all, or my feelings. He doesn't care if he embarrasses me in front of my friends. That was so humiliating what he did this afternoon. Maybe we'll laugh about it some day, Ben said. You know, like in a hundred years or so. She laughed. Ben could always make her laugh. So why was she going out with a stranger on Saturday night? Just because he was a stranger? Just because he wasn't Ben? Am I really that tired of Ben? She asked herself. No, not really. What are you thinking about? Ben asked, holding on to the car door handle as she slid around a corner. The car bumped hard against the high curb. The bump seemed to shake all thoughts from her head. Uh, nothing, she said. Just driving. Well, what do you want to do Saturday night? He asked. Jerry's parents are going to be away, so he's having a party. A real blowout, he says. You know, Jerry. That probably means he'll have a can of beer for everyone to pass around and take a sip. He laughed, expecting her to join in, but she didn't. She was concentrating on coming up with an excuse for Saturday night. Uh, why don't you go to Jerry's party? He looked confused. Without you? Yeah, I, uh, can't go out Saturday night. She turned another corner, carefully this time, onto Hedgerow Drive, Ben Street. Because of your uncle. Did he ground you because of this afternoon? No, we, uh, have to visit these people, cousins, my aunt's cousins. They insisted I come along. Wow, am I a bad liar, Heather thought. I can't even make it sound halfway believable. Oh, I see. Ben wasn't buying it. That was pretty obvious. She had to make him believe it, she decided. Why make him feel bad? Why make him suspicious? Would you like to come visit the cousins with me? She asked, a sudden inspiration. It wouldn't be any fun, but at least we'd be together. How would your uncle feel about that? Ben asked unhappily. Yeah, I guess you're right, Heather said, pulling into his drive, the tires skidding up the low slope. But it might be fun to bring you along, just to make him angry. No, it wouldn't, Ben said quietly. He'd probably throw me out of the car while it was moving or something. Your uncle isn't too subtle. Tell me about it, Heather said bitterly. She yawned. Get out, okay? I'm tired. I can't see straight. This stupid job. Okay, okay. I can take a hint, Ben said, struggling to unclick the seatbelt. Heather felt bad. She didn't like hurting him. She didn't like disappointing him. She had so few friends. She didn't like disappointing any of them. Hey, she said, smiling playfully. 
She leaned over, covered his hands with hers, and kissed him. He returned the kiss, hard, then harder. His kiss seemed different to her, needier somehow, almost desperate. Can he read my mind, she wondered, putting her arms around him. It was a long, passionate kiss. She couldn't help it. She couldn't control it. All the while, she was thinking about Snowman. Chapter 7 Everything glowed silver-white, then a tall pine tree. Its branches, dark shadows beneath a covering of snow, came into focus. The snow-covered hill sloped steeply at her feet. Heather raised a mittened hand to her forehead to shield her eyes. Her breath came out in little puffs of white against the aqua sky. Her bright red boots crunched noisily over the deep snow. Despite the snow, the air was warm. She was wearing her down jacket unzipped. A long red wool scarf was wrapped several times around her neck. She stepped up to the sled. It was an old-fashioned wooden sled with red metal runners and the words American Flyer stenciled in red on the wood. Such a beautiful day for sledding, she thought. A perfect day. Why am I the only one on the hill? A blue shadow moved in front of her path. On the snow, she felt a sudden chill in the air. The shadow was long and lean, a dark blot on the pure, sparkling snow. Heather turned around to see who was making the shadow. Uncle James! He stared at her, then down at the sled. He was wearing the yellow ski jacket and the same baggy brown corduroys, one trouser leg over his boot, one leg under. The sun filled his thick eyeglasses with bright golden light. She couldn't see his eyes. Uncle James, what are you doing up here? Do you know how to sled? he asked. Yeah, sure, she said. Then she added to herself, no thanks to you. He had never taken her sledding, not once. He had never taken her anywhere, had never played with her or taken her to the movies or done any of the normal things fathers did with daughters. He had no interest in entertaining her. He kicked at the back of the sled with his black rubber boot. It skid forward a few inches. Let me see you sled, he said. What? It's a perfect day, Heather. A perfect day for sledding. She stared at him, surprised by the request. She still couldn't see his eyes. The sun reflected in the glass lenses acted as a shield. Okay, she said. She loved sledding. She loved the ease of it, the feel of gliding so softly, so gracefully. It was so easy, it wasn't like real life at all. It was always like sliding through a soft, white dream. She bent down and grabbed a wooden sled rudder. Then she dropped easily onto her stomach on the sled. Give me a push, she asked, turning her head back to see her uncle. No, he said. What? No. Don't lie down. Sit up. I want to ride, too. You want to sled with me? He nodded his narrow head. He looks like a toothpick. Is he as brittle as a toothpick? As fragile? She pulled herself up, slid around. Now she was sitting in the front. Climb on, Uncle James, she said. Plenty of room. It took him forever to lower himself onto the sled and arrange his long legs behind her. Hold on to my waist, she said. His grip was hesitant, light. It felt strange to have him holding onto her like that. In all the time she had spent growing up in his house, he'd never touched her, except by accident. Except for the times he had slapped her face in anger. She gripped the sides of the sled. The snow sparkled as if millions of tiny diamonds were embedded in it. It became so bright she closed her eyes. Ready? she called back to him. Ready, he replied, tightening his grip on her waist. She leaned forward, moving her weight toward the front of the sled. They began to slide, slowly at first, then picking up speed. Looking down, the slope of the hill seemed steeper than she remembered, much steeper. Perfect, she thought. A perfect day for sledding. The top of the snow was wet and ice hard. So fast. We'll go down so fast. Like a roller coaster that only goes down, down, down. So perfect. Here we go, she cried happily. They were sliding down now, faster, faster, gliding so easily. Heather felt the wind against her face, listened to the quiet whisper of the runners against the snow. The hill seemed endless. She couldn't see the bottom. She could only see the onrushing white snow. But there had to be a bottom, right? There had to be an end. They were really speeding now, down, down, plummeting down. She aimed the sled at the tall pine tree, aimed it dead center at the wide, dark trunk. They were going so fast, like a speeding train. A few feet from the tree, Heather leaned to the right and jumped off. She rolled onto the snow and kept rolling, so cold, so wet, so easy. The loud crack she heard was the sound of her uncle's head hitting the tree trunk. The impact split his head in two, and his body went flying backward, up high in the air. Awakening from her dream, Heather sat up in bed and stretched. Such a vivid dream. She could remember every detail. She dressed quickly for school and went down to breakfast with a smile on her face. Chapter 8 I'm so nervous I can't decide what to wear, Heather said, wrapping the phone cord around her wrist. Well, okay, I'll go out with him then, Kim said on the other end. She giggled her hoarse giggle. Where are you going? To the woods. Across the room, Heather's uncle put down his newspaper and gave her a suspicious look. You know, the dance club, Heather added quickly. Her uncle made a sour face and resumed reading his paper. 
Heather turned her face to the living room wall and lowered her voice as she talked to Kim. Uncle James is listening to every word I say, she whispered. It makes me so mad. He's sitting there pretending to read his newspaper. Why don't you get your own phone, Kim asked. He won't let me. He says one phone is enough for a house. Can you imagine? One phone in the living room. I've no privacy, Kim. None at all. She hadn't realized she had raised her voice. Her uncle shot her another dirty look. Could you get off the phone? I can't hear myself think, he called loudly. Loudly enough for Kim to hear. I just got on, Heather said through gritted teeth, trying to control her temper. None of your back talk, he said, pretending to read the paper. I've got to go, Kim, Heather said angrily. Wear the red top, Kim said. You know, the silky one. You look great in that one. Thanks. Bye. I'll call you tomorrow. She replaced the receiver and started up to her room. About time you started chipping in on the phone bill, Uncle James said. You make most of the calls, you know. I'll be glad to pay for my own phone, Heather said, stopping at the bottom of the stairs. He pretended he hadn't heard her. Going out again, huh? He said. It is Saturday night, Heather said brusquely. What about your schoolwork? I don't suppose you've given that any thought. Luckily, Aunt Belle came in from the kitchen to ask Uncle James a question, giving Heather a chance to escape up the stairs. Thank you, Aunt Belle, she thought, hurrying into her room. One more second of that conversation, I don't know what I would have said. Saturday nights were always so tense. Uncle James carried on every Saturday before she went out, just trying to get her upset and nervous before her date, and usually succeeding. And I do hope this new boyfriend of yours is picking you up at the house, he shouted up the stairs. James, let her get dressed, she heard Aunt Belle plead. But he never listened to her, either. He was even more of a bully to Heather's frail, poor aunt, always bossing her around, telling her what to do and how to do it, what to wear, treating her like she was his personal slave. Why does she put up with it, Heather wondered. Because she's so frail and weak? Sometimes Heather looked through their old photo album at the photos of her aunt and uncle when they were young. Her aunt seemed so much stronger in those photos, so lively and full of spirit. He's destroyed her, Heather decided. He's just bullied her and bossed her till she has no spirit left at all. Well, he called up the stairs as she pulled on the silky red top. Yes, he's picking me up here, Heather called down. You can check him out and make him feel as uncomfortable as everyone else I bring here. She had gone too far and she knew it. It's just that I'm nervous and he won't leave me alone, she thought. He muttered something, a string of curses most likely, then shouted, I'm sick of your smart mouth. I'm not going to take it much longer. She forced herself not to reply. She froze, listening to whether he was coming up the stairs to confront her. He loved to draw out arguments, to keep badgering her in his reedy voice. He loved to see her get more and more upset. He never let anything drop. Heather glanced at the clock on the wall above her desk. It was a little after eight o'clock. Snowman would be there any minute. Maybe, just maybe she could introduce him to her aunt and uncle and then hurry out of the house before Uncle James had the time to start an argument with him. Snowman seemed like such an understanding guy. He had dropped by the restaurant the night before, just before closing. Mel was out back, so Heather slipped Snowman a free plate of french fries and a Coke. When she told him it was a rule of her uncle's that he had to meet every boy Heather went out with, Snowman told her not to look so worried. He had no problem with coming to her house. I know how to handle adults, he had said, his dark eyes staring confidently into hers. My uncle is real difficult, she had said. No problem, Snowman repeated, gobbling the french fries hungrily one after the other. I'll have him eating right here, he said, holding up the palm of his right hand. Heather laughed bitterly. You don't know my uncle. Then she turned and saw Mel glaring at her from the window to the kitchen, so she hurried to clear away some booths. When she looked back, Snowman was gone. In place of a tip, he had left a folded up piece of paper beside the plate. Heather put down the stack of dirty dishes she was carrying, picked up the paper, and unfolded it. Drawn in pencil was a snowman, just two circles with a top hat and a smiling face, and beside the snowman was a little heart. How sweet, Heather thought, folding up the piece of paper and tucking it into the pocket of her skirt. What a nice tip. Thinking about it now brought a smile to her face. She finished brushing her hair and glanced at the clock for the nine thousandth time. It was ten after eight. She nervously squeezed the plastic butane lighter in her hand twirling it around in her fingers, waiting for the doorbell to ring. And there it was. Even though she was waiting for it, the doorbell's loud ring made her jump. She tossed the lighter into her bag, then hurried down the stairs, hoping to get to the front door before her uncle. But she wasn't fast enough. Uncle James was already opening the door. Chapter 9 Heather stopped two-thirds of the way down the stairs, her heart pounding. Uncle James had pulled open the front door and was staring through the storm door at Snowman with a look of undisguised displeasure on his face. Are you Heather's date? he asked, as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He still hadn't opened the storm door. Poor Snowman was standing out in the cold. 
For goodness sake, let him in, Heather cried, hurrying down the last few stairs and pushing past her uncle to open the storm door. A blast of cold air accompanied Snowman into the room. Hi, he said, smiling at her. He was wearing a 50s-style oversized gray wool overcoat. He stamped the snow off his boots. Close the door. You're letting out all the heat, her uncle complained, looking Snowman up and down. This is my Uncle James, Heather said, pushing the front door closed. As if you haven't guessed, she thought, I, I'll get my coat. And maybe we can get out of here fast if Uncle James starts anything, she thought. I didn't catch your name, her uncle said to Snowman, suspicion in his voice. Heather realized she didn't know his real name. She only knew him as Snowman. She started to say something when Snowman spoke up first. It's Bill, he said, looking at Heather. Bill Jeffers. Jeffers? What kind of name is that? Uncle James asked loudly. You Hungarian? No, Snowman gave him a pleasant smile. There's a little bit of everything in my family, I guess. I don't really know where we're from. Just a mutt, Uncle James said under his breath. Heather pulled on her coat. She started to tug Snowman toward the door, but Aunt Belle came into the room. She looks so tired, Heather thought. She's only 45, but she looks so much older. Her once bright copper hair was now mostly gray. This is my Aunt Belle, Heather said quickly. It's nice to meet you, her aunt extended her tiny hand, and Snowman shook it. Look at his hair, Uncle James said to Aunt Belle, snickering. Ever see a young guy with white hair like that? He turned back to Snowman. Guess you've got a lot of worries, huh? Stop it, James, scolded Heather's aunt. You're embarrassing him. That's okay, Snowman said, giving her a warm smile. I'm used to a lot of kidding. I've had this white hair my whole life. Some kind of albino, Uncle James muttered. Hush up, Aunt Belle told him. Strong words for her. Heather could tell that she liked Snowman. I really like your house, Snowman said, looking around the living room. It looks so comfortable, like a real family lives here. Aunt Belle beamed. Well, I try to make it a real home for all of us. Is that your car? Uncle James asked, staring out the living room window to the driveway, where a black Toyota Celica was parked. No, actually, I borrowed it from a friend. Don't have your own, huh? Uncle James asked. He made the question sound like an accusation. My family just moved here a short while ago, Stinman said. We haven't had the time to buy a new car. What does your father do? Uncle James demanded. Uncle James, please, Heather cried angrily. Then she softened it by saying, Bill and I are going to be late. My father isn't alive, Snowman said, pushing back his thick white hair with one hand, his face becoming an expressionless blank. Uncle James just stared at him in silence, his eyes cold, unfeeling. That's too bad, Aunt Belle said uncomfortably. She fussed with the color of her house dress. Come on, Bill, let's go, Heather tugged open the front door. It was very nice meeting you both, Snowman said. I'll get Heather back, nice and early. Hope to see you again. He really does know how to talk to adults, Heather thought admiringly. Maybe Uncle James has met his match here. Maybe Snowman can manage to outcharm him. What should I say if Ben calls? Uncle James asked, a thin-lipped smile on his face. What? Her question startled her. It was so unexpected. What should I say if your boyfriend calls? Uncle James said. You remember Ben, don't you? Heather could feel her face turning bright red. Uncle James knew just how to embarrass her. Why was he doing this? Why did he want to upset her, make her feel so bad? Why did he hate her so much? James, I really don't think, Aunt Belle started. Shut up, James snapped, turning an angry glance on his wife. Good night, Heather said disgustedly, and pulled Snowman out the door. The cold night air felt good on her face. She took his arm as they headed down the drive to the car. Wow, she said softly, shaking her head still agitated over her uncle's deliberate thoughtlessness. Wow. He's a lot of laughs, Snowman said sarcastically. I warned you about him, Heather said, and then she quickly added, You're not upset or anything. I mean, about him? She pulled open the passenger door and climbed in. It was colder inside the car. The seats were ice cold. The car smelled of oranges. Snowman slid behind the wheel and slammed the door. He's no problem, he said, reaching into the overcoat pocket for the ignition key. Really, my dad was a lot like that, only worse. Really? Heather shifted in the seat, shivering. Worse than Uncle James? Yeah, Snowman said, starting up the car. But I handled him, he winked at her. Guess I can handle your uncle. Well, you were very good in there, Heather said. Uncle James tried to insult you, but you just wouldn't let him get under your skin. I told you, Heather, adults are no problem for me. I really can handle them. Well, I think my aunt is in love with you already. What you said about the house must have made her day. She worked so hard to keep the house really nice, and it isn't easy because Uncle James won't let her spend a nickel. Let's not talk about them tonight, Snowman said, backing down the drive. Let's just party, okay? Sounds good, Heather said, settling back in the low seat. 
Could we have some heat? Yeah, sure. As he drove down the street, he fumbled with the dashboard controls. I just have to find it. You don't know where the heat control is? She leaned forward to help him. Her hand landed on his. She left it there for a few moments. His hand was very warm. I told you I borrowed the car from a friend. Hey, here it is. He slid a dial to the right. The heat should come up soon. A few seconds later, the air from the heater started to warm up. He turned onto Park Drive, the car moving silently past snowy yards, the headlights bright white against the night sky. Still want to go to the woods, he asked. Yeah, sure, if you want to. Are you a good dancer? The best, he said, grinning at her. Well, at least you're modest. Actually, I was lying. I danced like a water buffalo on roller skates. I've never seen a water buffalo on roller skates, Heather said. Well, you will tonight. He pressed down the gas pedal and the car spurted forward, its tires protesting at first, sliding on a patch of icy road. They talked easily, aimlessly for a while, about the town, about school. Heather found herself doing most of the talking. It feels so comfortable with him, she thought. I can't believe I was so nervous before he arrived. She turned, leaning against the door, and took a long look at him. Passing streetlights made his hair seem to blink on and off, white then black, white then black. The changing in light made his brown eyes seem to flicker with his hair. They looked dark and intense, staring straight ahead as they followed the twin headlight beams. He's really great looking, Heather thought. I even like the cleft in his chin. She wondered what it would be like to kiss him, to wrap her hands in his thick white hair. The blowing heat made her feel warm and dreamy. It was so cozy in the car now, so cozy sitting beside Snowman, watching the dark houses roll past. Suddenly, Snowman's expression changed. He looked in the rearview mirror. It filled with light. He looked away, then looked again. Whoa, he said quietly, his eyes narrowing as he stared into the mirror. He pushed down hard on a gas. The car uttered a loud roar and sped forward. Heather sank back into the seat. Snowman, what's wrong? He checked the mirror again, his face not revealing any emotion at all. I think we're being followed. Chapter 10 The light in the rearview mirror seemed to get brighter. Light filled the car as if someone had thrown a spotlight onto it. Snowman made a sharp right, the tires squealing. His eyes kept darting from the windshield to the mirror. His face still revealed no emotion, no tension. Heather's first thought was that it was Ben. Ben had been terribly upset that Heather wasn't going out with him tonight, she remembered. And her excuse had been pretty lame. Maybe Ben suspected that she was going out with someone else. But did that mean he would spy on her? Follow her and her date? That didn't sound like Ben. He wasn't the most secure guy in the world, but he wasn't crazy. Who is it? she asked, gripping the door handle with one hand and the bottom of the seat with her other. Are you sure they're following us? Snowman, his eyes intent on the road, didn't answer. The street was icy and slick. The car slid. Snowman turned the wheel in the direction of the slide, pulling them out of it just before they slammed into the side of a station wagon, parked at the curb. Heather closed her eyes. She realized she'd been holding her breath. She opened her eyes, surprised to see Snowman still calm, still cold as ice. The light from the headlights behind them still filled the car, making Snowman's white hair seem to glow. He roared through a stop sign and made the next left, the car squealing into the narrow street, lined with low, dark houses. It took Heather a little while to realize that the headlights were gone. Snowman had slowed down. He glanced at her and shrugged. What happened? she asked, reluctantly releasing her grip on the door handle. Sorry, he said quietly. Huh? What do you mean? Guess I've been watching too many bad TV shows. You mean? He had a very sheepish look on his face. I mean, I don't think we were being followed. Heather slumped back in the seat, her heart still pounding. She couldn't decide whether to laugh or be furious. Do you always think people are after you? she asked. He shook his head. He turned left again and headed to River Road, where the woods was located just out of town. What made you think we were being followed? Heather asked. Is someone following you for some reason? Have you been followed before? He laughed. Maybe it was a friend of yours, Heather. There's no one after me. Maybe it was an angry customer from your restaurant, someone you spilled soup on. I haven't spilled soup on anyone in weeks, Heather said, pretending to be offended by the idea. Well, maybe it was your Uncle James, checking up on my driving skills. Heather made a face and shoved his shoulder playfully. Hey, I'm trying to drive, he protested. Give me a break. You give me a break, Heather said. You scared me to death. For no reason, he grinned. His dark eyes seemed to grin, too. I just don't want you to think I'm boring. Come on, Heather demanded. Did you really think we're being followed or not? He slowed down for a traffic light. Whoever it was, was right on my tail, he said, getting serious. And the headlights were so bright. I guess he had his brights on. He was keeping so close to us, I guess I... I guess I just lost it for a moment. He looked really embarrassed now. Heather decided she'd better stop questioning him. She turned and looked out the window. The houses had given way to wide, empty fields. They were nearly out of town. 
"'What's that in your hand?' he asked. Heather looked down, surprised. She hadn't even realized she was holding her father's lighter. She held it up. "'Just a lighter. It belonged to my father. I keep it as a good luck charm.' "'You don't smoke, do you?' "'No, I don't even think it works. It's just, well, he didn't leave me much. My parents were killed when I was three. I don't really remember them.' Snowman didn't reply. They drove on in silence. "'Well, Heather, you certainly know how to end a conversation,' she thought, scolding herself for being so grim. "'Your dad is dead, too,' she blurted out, remembering his conversation with her uncle. "'Yeah, he didn't even leave me a lighter.' His words were bitter, but his face didn't reveal any hard feelings. "'Which brings up a difficult subject.' "'What's that?' Heather asked. "'Well, uh, are you sure you want to go dancing? Maybe we could just hang out somewhere and talk or something.' "'I've got plenty of money,' Heather said quickly, realizing at once what his problem was. "'I just got paid yesterday.' "'Well, how about we go half and half?' he asked, looking uncomfortable. "'I'm really sorry.' "'No problem,' she interrupted, touching his hand. "'I don't mind at all, really. "'My mom and my brother and I, well, we're on a pretty tight budget, you know, since we moved in everything. "'I'm going to get an after-school job. I just haven't had time yet. "'But when I do, I'll make it up to you, Heather, really.' "'No problem,' Heather repeated. "'I don't mind paying my share. It's only fair.' "'You've been terrific to me,' he said, giving me free food and everything. "'I'll pay you back. Really, I will.' "'Stop,' she said. "'Don't say another word about it. Let's just have a good time. It doesn't matter to me who pays.' He turned onto the gravel parking lot outside the woods. The lot was nearly filled with cars. Even through the closed car doors, Heather could hear the booming rhythm of the music from inside the small dance club. Snowman parked near the end of the lot and they stepped out into the cold, crisp night. Heather took a deep breath. The air smells so fresh, she said, her shoes crunching on the snow-covered gravel. I love winter, don't you? Hey, my name is Snowman, right? I've got to love winter. He took her hand and led her into the throbbing dance club.